So welcome and good afternoon, morning or evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Spencer Ruckty, I'm the author events manager for Third Place Books uh, in Seattle, Washington, which is celebrating its 25th year in business uh, and on behalf of Third Place um, and Thank You Books in Birmingham, uh, Brazos Bookstore in Houston and Community Bookstore in Brooklyn. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Kate Briggs and Pip Adams, uh, who will be joined in conversation by Danielle Dutton, the co-founder and editor of Dorothy, a publishing project. Um, thank you again for watching. And to those of you uh, who haven't already, feel free to say hello in the chat. Let us know our enthusiastic supporters of Dorothy Books. Um, I'm always telling publishers you should publish fewer books. Uh, and Dorothy is the only one who listens. Uh, they publish two a year, uh, which means I can read both of them. And that is a great joy. Uh, third Place Books hosts well over 200 author events a year, uh, mostly in person these days, but we do open our uh, Zoom platform for international authors. Uh, you can sign up for our email newsletter at thirdplacebooks.com uh, for more virtual events like these. Uh, or if you're in Seattle, uh, we have a wonderful lineup this year. Uh, you can come see Pulitzer Prize winner Kwa Su. Um, who, uh, for the paperback release of his uh, wonderful memoir, Stay True. Um, we have Ed Park for his new novel, Same Bed, Different Dreams on November 14th. Um, and we are celebrating University Press Week this uh, year, which is in the middle of November, um, which means on November 18th, we uh, will have Ukrainian journalist and fiction writer, Olena Stayaskina um, with translator Dominique Kaufman. Um, as mentioned, that chat window is open at the bottom of your screen, and we encourage you to use it respectfully today. And during the last 15 minutes or so of our program, we will have time for your questions. So if you have questions for our authors this uh, afternoon, please submit those in the Q&A window below, which is separate from the chat window at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and a reminder that this event will be recorded. So if you miss anything, uh, we'll be emailing the recording to everyone who registered. Uh, and of course, you can order the new animal uh, or sorry, the new animals and the long form from your neighborhood independent bookstores. Uh, every purchase you make supports the future of our author series. So thank you. And now I am pleased to introduce today's speakers. Uh, Kate Briggs lives and works in Rotterdam, where she co-founded or founded and co-runs the writing and publishing project Short Pieces That Move. Uh, she is the translator of two volumes of Roland Barthes' lecture and seminar notes at the Collège de France. Uh, the Preparation of the Novel and How to Live Together, both published by Columbia University Press. Uh, in 2017, I have this with me, uh, Fitzcarraldo Editions published This Little Art, which is a narrative essay on the practice and art of translation. It's an absolutely phenomenal book. Uh, and in 2021, Kate Briggs was awarded a Wyndham Campbell Prize. Uh, and for the long form, she is currently a finalist for the prestigious Goldsmith Prize, which is very exciting. Uh, Pip Adam uh, lives in Wellington, New Zealand, and is the author of four novels, Audition, Nothing to See, I'm Working on a Building, and The New Animals, which won the Jan Medlicott Acorn Prize for Fiction. She also wrote the short, short story collection, Everything We Hope For, which won the New Zealand Society of Authors Hubert Church Best for First Book Award in 2011. Pip also makes the Better Off Red podcast, which is why she has a much better recording setup than anyone else on this screen right now. Uh, in moderating today's conversation, as is tradition, we have Daniel Dutton, which, uh, who is Dorothy's co-founder and editor. Uh, Dutton is also the author of Sprawl from Wave Books, uh, Margaret the First, a novel, pu novel published by Catapult in 2016. And next year, uh, the long-awaited book, Prairie Dresses Art Other Out from Coffeehouse Press in April of 2024. Uh, so please join me in welcoming these wonderful authors to the screen. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, and giant thanks to the wonderful Third Place Books, Brazos Bookstores, Community Bookstore, and Thank You Books for hosting us. I'm totally thrilled to be here today with our two brand new Dorothy authors, Pip Adam, who is Zooming in at 8 a.m. tomorrow from New Zealand, and Kate Briggs, who is Zooming at us from the Netherlands at 9 p.m. tonight. Um, Pip and Kate, hello. Thank you for being here. I'm in love with both of your books. Um, and they are incidentally the two longest books we've ever published. Um, the spines are very impressive um, at Dorothy. So I'm really excited to talk about them with you. We're gonna, just so everyone knows, we're gonna go alphabetically. Um, 
We have an A and a B name. Um, with a, we're going to start with a short reading from Pip and then a little bit of conversation with Pip and then a short reading from Kate and a little bit of conversation with Kate. And then I have lots of questions, but I'm also happy to bring in audience questions as we go. So Pip, good morning. Hello to you. Uh, Thanks for coming. Hello, everyone. Kia ora. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Spencer. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, um, I am uh, coming to you from the unceded land of um, Te Atiawa, um, Taranaki, Whanui, and um, Ngati Toa, Rangatira. Um, yeah, I, I'm very, very grateful to be here. Um, yeah, thanks so much, everyone. I'm just going to read a little bit from my book. I'm so in love with this book, um, the way that it's made. Um, yeah, I still feel a bit nervous about the interior, but there you go. Um yeah, so I don't think you need to know much in here is that except that Doug is a dog. Um, the pronouns for Doug are she, her, um, which can get a bit confusing. Um, and um, yeah, there are a few other names mentioned that I don't think you need to worry about. So here we go. Seeing Doug made Carla angry, that she couldn't take Doug for a run, that Tommy had made the dick move about shooting tomorrow, which no one else had said anything about, like maybe no. Not Kurt, not Cal, not the photographer, not Sharona. What could Carla do? She was a fucking hairdresser. Who was going to listen to her? She'd been cutting hair for nearly 30 years. All she could do was hair, which was important if it was done badly, but pretty much invisible if it was done well. What could she have said? A child shouted outside and Doug barked and ran to the door, almost knocking Carla over. The dog jumped and jumped and jumped at the door like she'd knock it down. Carla watched, then banged on the door too, shouted at the street, and the child shouted like she could get the attention of the child and escape with them. She'd had no business getting a dog, but no one else would take her. The stylist got the dog from someone under false pretenses, promising a forever home, so they couldn't take it back there. The client was an idiot. The photographer didn't say no, and no one asked Carla, and she had no place to speak out. So she sat back and listened to them in the meeting, making notes in her notebook. The dog's ears were battle cropped. The dog has no ears and the model has no hips, the client said when they both came into, onto the set. Could Carla not do something with the dog? The photographer this time from behind the camera, not even looking up from the viewfinder. What? Carla, finally, getting a word in, what? The dog wasn't very shiny. It looked bad next to the shiny dress. It's got mange, the stylist now, arms folded, head to one side, but not unsure, completely sure. It was the only one without ears. Could Carla not spray something on the dog's mange? Carla didn't think so. She didn't know anything about dog hair, only human hair, but she'd gone over just the same, rubbing a soft waxy product between her hands as she walked, smoothing down the hair over the mange, but being careful of the mange. She looked in its eyes then, and on the way back, when she got to the stylist, said, what are you going to do with the dog? They won't take it back. The stylist was already packing up, putting a pair of $1,000 shoes in a box, in a bag. Then they took some photos. Then everyone was packing up, lights, reflectors, and the dog was lying down and looking up every time someone came near. Bad career choices, bad money choices. A year later, the dog was impossible. Carla brought out the worst in it. At least the dog didn't have mange anymore. Carla had worked hard to get her coat back in condition. She still had no ears. She was brindle with a vicious face. At first, Carla walked her before sunrise so they wouldn't meet any other dogs. Doug would jump up on Carla's bed, sniff at her, breathe, lick her. Carla would roll out of bed and they'd be off down the street in the orange of the street lamps, across the road, into the park, the cricket fields in summer, rugby fields in winter, to where they could both look out over the quarry that was a suburb now, over the school, the apartments, the townhouses, soccer fields that would be astroturfed and the netball courts. Carla usually wore a beanie. It fell back on her head under the weight of her hair. She'd sit with Doug and they'd look out over all of it, the city and its yellow glow like a Gregory Crudson photograph, still. Sometimes Carla's eyes would blur in the cold and it would look like she could dive deep into it. They'd start the walk back before the sun rose. But then Doug had killed a cat and Carla didn't know her anymore. Doug had looked up over the animal's body at Carla like she was recognising the situation for the first time, who was in charge and which one of them could kill the other. 
Pulling away, Doug painted in a way that made her look like she was smiling. Then she turned to walk away because it was time to go. Carla hadn't walked her the next day or the next. Carla thought about the photographer, the stylist, and the client. Thought how all of them were awful, but how Doug was the worst one. Carla had been the styler, seen the stylist a few times since she'd taken Doug home. Everyone had finished packing up and the dog was still there. Uh, are you just going to leave him? Carla asked. The stylist shrugged. They were in an alley behind some state houses in Henderson. The stylist had the thousand dollar shoe bag tucked under her arm now. Then her phone rang and she looked at the screen. I've got to take this, she said and walked away. It was just Carla and the dog. Then everyone had, be, everyone had been calling it Doug. She took Doug to the vet on the way home to get some food and to see about the mange and the ears. They'd been taken off when she was a puppy, the vet thought, not, a, not by a vet. It's a girl. Carla had already filled out the forms. She'd been calling the dog Doug in an attempt to make it feel comfortable about the strange car and the stranger, to make herself feel comfortable about how big Doug was, how loud her bark was when they passed other dogs outside the car on the footpath. She's a pit bull, the vet said. You'll need to keep her inside. People steal them all the time. The stylist never asked about Doug. Wouldn't. The owners of the cat put up a poster. Doug was in charge of the house now. Thank you. Thank you, Pip. Um, that passage is great. Um, it's so fun to hear you read it in your voice. Um, you have an accent um, for the rest of us. And, but, you know, your book is so New Zealand that it feels right to hear it in your voice, too. So that's very cool. Um, so that passage actually brought up two different things I want to talk about, one of which is Doug. But I'm going to ask you about the other thing um, first, I think. But this, I wanted to tell you that this morning when I checked X, formerly known as Twitter, someone had replied to one of our posts about the new animals. Um, and they had said, quote, I really believe that when the new animals was published in New Zealand, it marked a radical, thrilling and necessary shift in the literary landscape here. Actually, I feel like a little choked up reading that. It's like, what an amazing and thing to say about um, one book. And um, and it really is a thrilling book, Pip. And um, I wanted to tell you that one of the challenges of marketing the new animals is that there's this amazing, thrilling turn in it. There's a swerve. Um, and everything after this swerve, well, the story just undergoes a radical change. Um, and when I'm telling people about your book, it feels important to really not say too much about that aspect of it, because in my own initial reading of the book was so powerful. Um, and I, I going in, I really didn't know what was going to happen. And so I was just like swept away by the book. Um, and I, I, we were, we just did the Brooklyn Book Festival last weekend and our publicist Kate Estrella was telling everyone at the Brooklyn Book Fair, it was very, it was very good um, salesmanship, but she told everybody like no book has surprised me as much as this book in many, many, many years. So, um, okay. So there's this thing that happens and I'm not going to ask you about it, but I just had to acknowledge it. I feel like, um, um, and I mean, honestly, I do want to ask you about it, but I want to preserve the reading experience for other people. So I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to ask you about work, um, which that passage really beautifully brought up. So just for those of you who still have the book on your TBR pile, um, much of the book takes place over one the course of one night um, as a group of people from different um, generations and class backgrounds are working sort of scrambling to put together a last minute photo shoot. Um, and that was mentioned in that passage. So I wanted to ask if you if you set out to write a book about work specifically or the fashion industry specifically, or I could ask, like, what drove you to want to write a book about work or the fashion industry? Oh, kia ora. Thanks, Danielle. Um, yeah, I think that was Karen Duss that wrote that very kind thing. And I think, um, yeah, I think it was a it's a beautiful thing to write. And I think more than the book, what I think it was about is the generosity of readers here. Like I think, yeah, there were a couple of quite early champions for the book. And um yeah, I, I just feel very grateful for I think, yeah, it, it, I, I just feel very grateful for people, including Karen. Um yeah, um yeah, yeah. So I'm obsessed with work. Um I was 
I left school when I was about 15. There was a mutual agreement between me and the and the high school that it was probably time for me to go. <laughs> and um, I took up a hairdressing apprenticeship at 15. And um, I was very grateful for that. You know, like I, we are not a family that had gone to university before me and you know like the trades were very important in my family and work was really important in my family and I just am really interested in the power structures that are in work and the um just like the forcing of relationships that happen in work and the way we bring this different self to work and um yeah I, I'm really interested in the way that it kind of intersects politically with capitalism and all that sort of thing and the fashion industry as as a slight obsession like I was um reading a lot about um fast fashion the book was written in two it, it was you know based in 2016 you know like um and yeah I just it was kind of horrified um around that and at the same time was kind of thinking of that weird time I'm I'm very old and like when I started hairdressing it was when fast fashion first started and it was an incredible thing as a hairdresser because it's one the service the fashion industries and the service industries and the beauty industries are weird because you're paid very poorly but expected to look very good <laughs> And it's um so when this this fast fashion came out, it was revolutionary. It was like I no longer have to like, you know, like I can look good and clothes that cost little. And so all those things were kind of roaming around in me. And also like there was this very interesting thing happening around the 2010s kind of era where very rich um young people were kind of this this difference in wealth happened in New Zealand where we suddenly got these very rich people who were doing all sorts of passion projects like um, fashion labels and film companies and it was really interesting and then there were a few of us who were older who were kind of working with them and still not earning very much money but yeah sorry that was long-winded but yeah it, I was very interested in that stuff yeah no, that was, that is super interesting and not long winded. So, and then like the other day, I think you X on X, um, that, uh, you were gonna, it was like your U.S. pub day debut and you were going to go cut some hair. Is that right? Yeah. But, yeah. So you, do you still cut hair? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really love hair. Um, a lot of my hair cutting at the moment is, um, um, yeah, like I, um, what I'm really starting to see at the moment is the place of, um, um, hair cutting and hair styling and kind of gender affirming care kind of like I think um, it's one of my favorite things like I think that um, you know like you know um, I think that sometimes it's very difficult um, to uh, hairdressing salons are difficult places for everybody I think you know like I uh, I don't know I, I get overwhelmed by them when I go in and like yeah I'm doing quite a lot of hair cutting at the moment for friends at their places and you know we can take a little bit more time and you know like yeah like and I really it really um yeah I find it an incredible privilege to cut people's hair now and yeah I really I really still love it I really love it yeah <laughs> I love that whole answer. I tried to cut one friend's hair once and I got, I was like, I can totally do this. And then as soon as I got there, right there with this hair and the scissors, I just became like hysterical with laughter and couldn't cut a single hair. Um, I don't know. You just made that weird memory from when I was like 21. Come back. To me. Um, okay. Sorry. That was the pointless digression. Um, I have a million more questions for you, but I'm going to pull in Kate real fast. Kate. Hello. Um, good evening to you. Um, Will you read to us a little bit? I will, I will. Um, and thank you, Pip. It was amazing to hear that passage in your voice. I was hoping for a passage from the end. I know you can't, you can't. That's the structure of the book, but it was extraordinary to hear it in your voice. Um, I just begin, I'll just begin without, um, without preamble. Hello, baby, Helen said, turning her face to look directly at the baby in the chair, her huge face looming in. Hey, babe, she said to amuse herself, because who really said baby? Hey, she said it once, smiling, seeking eye contact. Hey, she said it again, only this time more gently, breathing it out slowly, I greet you. Then touching at the different parts of the mobile, one after the other, setting each element of the composition moving, getting the whole delicate thing going 
relating and offsetting and making a sound pattern between them in the air. Hey, hey, hey. This is our situation. The baby, meanwhile, with her presence and her incipience, her actions and reactions, her own forms of experience, stared intently at Helen's forehead. The baby's name was Rose. The mobile suspended above Rose's easy chair. It nudged and slightly shuddered. It pressed, it lifted. Restless, it was never completely still. Thrumming beneath it, for Rose it was like this. The mobile like her sensing of the world. It was near and juddery, gapped with negative space, edgy and alive. More or less monochrome, patched with greys, bright pieces and looms of darker, heated shadow. It was like this, schematic, suspended, held in readiness, offering itself in one shaky arrangement, then another, in one close presentation, then another. The shapes it suspended were simple, very elemental. Sometimes they were layered, nested or split. One long afternoon, a week or so before Rose was born, Helen had sat largely on the floor, assembling them from a kit she'd ordered online. A round figure with no corners or edges, a circle. A plain figure, rational and even angled, a square. Two sharp triangles positioned head to toe, dots. A sample of une unevenly spaced dots, waves, a cross section of undulations. It was important that each shape offset the others, that each one be positioned at an appropriate dis distance from the others, for the whole thing to hover, hold itself out in space and counterbalance. It mattered that not one of its parts be given more weight. She'd done this with threading, with fiddly little knots, with clear fishing line. She clamped the shoulder of the, its supporting arm to her desk, and now independently, it moved, it turned, it jogged. With even the slightest current of air, a door opening, a person breathing near it, just heat. It could quiver, lift, and change direction. It rotated. It kept itself at a tolerable, tactful reserve. Though sometimes without warning, it encroached. For Rose, it could seem to rush at her, hemming down and packing her in. Her setup in the sprung chair under the mobile, it was formidable at times how much Rose could hate it, how a gentle turning scene, a place of contrast, of involvement, could stress her, bewilder and oppress her. For now, she studied it, the lilting canopy of overhead shapes, her focus lifted towards the circle, a big bright eye. It broke loose from the circle. It carried back to the undulation in the direction of the great light source of the window. She felt the movement as a change in her insides, which were interacting with the room. But Rose was a mass and a void too. She was pointed and gapped, full and empty, twisting and suspended, spacey and closed. She was dots. She was still holding to her proportions, now suddenly outsized. She was a retreating ebb now an ungathered but gathering, persistent flow. She kicked her legs. Like this, sensationally, kinetically, the world hung all around her. It took shape, it changed shape. It beckoned to her with its light and shadow and with the stretches and points of her interest, she turned towards it. Phasing through calm, then bored, agitated, then enlivened, stressed, then distressed, her sensational life force wholly uncontained by the space she could take up in a room, the crook of an arm, the dimensions of her tiny cotton suit. Rose flexed the space-time around her. It flexed back. She kicked out a leg to meet the world, and she vibrated it. Thank you, Kate. Um, that was beautiful. And actually, it tied, that passage ties in really well to something I wanted to start by asking you about, which is um, the book. The book really 
is really importantly focused on the question of duration, which we have talked about before a little bit. Um, and as a novel, it like insists on its own sense of duration um, and on time being taken on the novel's own terms, I think. Um, and I felt like I could kind of hear that just in, just in the passage you read. Um, and that insistence on duration alone and how you carry it off is like a really remarkable accomplishment. And I, I really, I want to share this from the, there was a wonderful LA Times review of the long form that came out this week. And a lot of it was about duration too. And I just thought this quote was so great. I wanted to read it um, through reviewer rights. I got the feeling over those 430 pages, not of interrupting my life by reading it, but understanding what it means to interrupt a book with life. And in this sense, the book comes to life in a way none other has for me, not a thing to be consumed, but a force exerting its own energy on me. Amazing. Um, people say amazing things about both of your books because they're amazing. Okay, but um, so I, I'm happy to talk about duration, but the long form insists on other things as well, like the value and complexity of domestic spaces and how structure itself is a form of meaning making in literature, but in life as well. And so my question is actually like, what did you start out to do? Um, if you can remember back, like what set you on this project and how did it grow? Was it, and it brings an essay and it brings in fielding. So like, what was the genesis, the seed? Do you remember? Wow. And yeah, that's a really, really immense question. Um, but you know, a wonderful one. Time, taking time on its own terms. So that's a really beautiful thing you just said as well, just noting that. I think the seed was the kind of desire. I really started, um, okay, the seed. Maybe I was thinking a short version of the seed rather than like a, you know, 24 hour version. I, um, I gave a lecture uh, in Glasgow um, at the invitation of my friend, uh, Sarah Tripp, who's an artist and writer who's based in Glasgow. And she and I were talking a lot about form and the different ways that we arrive at form, because she also makes uh, video works and she has a trainer, training as a dancer. And she invited me to give a lecture at um, Glasgow International, this kind of art moment that happens every couple of years in Glasgow. And the title of that lecture, I started reading John Dewey. And the title, of, can, um, did I stall there, Danielle? Can, I mean, you're still with me, yeah. Um, the, the title was, I am a live creature and I gave this, it wasn't even really a lecture, it was like this kind of weird bit of writing I'd written, um, kind of based on John Dewey, who's quite important to the book, particularly um, this pragmatic philosopher from this writing in the 1920s and 30s, at, I'm in America, I'm sure you know this, um, about, about rhythm, but also about composition and about how social composition and aesthetic composition might have some things to say to each other, but they might not exist on completely different planes in the way that we tend to separate them out. Like here's a kind of, here's a kind of social setup, a housing setup, and here's a work of art. Dewey, I think is so interesting about the, like how composition might kind of travel or some of the principles of composition might be as at work in the setup of a room as, as they are in the setup of a, of a page or a book. Anyway, so the genesis I think was like, me giving this strange lecture saying, I am a live preacher, this was our, which is a quotation from Dewey. And then I was like, and you are too, to the audience, we are live creatures, you know, forming time together. I, I can't even remember how it unfolded. Apart from that, I'd written this scene of, um, of, a, of a mother trying to get her child sort of to sleep. And it was a version of, of the opening of the long form. And there was just something in that laying alongside of some of the ideas from Dewey and this desire to write out what in my experience of um, my own sort of lived experience of like a really intensely dramatic moment the novel begins it's not really a spoiler to say the novel begins with a scene trying sort of to put a, get a baby to sleep walk her to sleep they're tired and then there's an interruption and the baby's away Rose is away you know and so the, the day gets diverted and needs to be recomposed and that felt to me like a scene of intensely high drama um, that I hadn't really read, written, uh, attending to, to its uh, consequentiality for the two participants involved. So long way around, Danielle, to say the seed was, I think, in that invitation from my friend and in that sort of lecture, which I don't know how it landed with the audience, but sort of putting those two things together, I then came home to Rotterdam and I started working on, on the novel. 
and then it just took another sort of five years <laughs> to, to kind of get to this point of holding this beautiful thing uh, and reading it to you. I mean, yeah. I feel like that's pretty good for five years. It took me 10 years to write a book that's like one this 16th that long. Um, it's, okay. a very, very good book. it's a very, very good book though. So just so make that clear. <laughs> Um, it's interesting too, what you're saying, like, uh, I feel like there's, you're talking about like this dramatic moment of motherhood. Um, but one thing you do so well is the, write the baby. I just had to throw that in there. Um, I want to talk to you about the baby. I want to talk to you about Doug, but I do have a question for both of you. Um, and actually, well, congratulations on being shortlisted for the Goldsmiths prize. Um, Kate, it's, it's a cool prize. It's, it's actually like a cool prize. And, um, I love that it's about innovation in the novel. Um, and I, I want to ask you both the same question, thinking about form and the novel. And you just sort of started talking about this, Kate, and or form and fiction. So since Dorothy started publishing like two books together every fall um, back in 2010, we've been interested in pairing books that fit or don't fit together in some provocative or productive way. So sometimes like I think the connection is obvious. Like we published Sabrina Oramark, who's here. Um, Sabrina Oramark's Wild Milk with Christina Rivera Garza's The Tiger Syndrome, and they both do really wild and hilarious or terrifying things with fairy tales. Um, but some years I think the fit is more like a provocation. Like we're putting into conversation two books that might not be put into conversation, like two approaches to form that might not normally be put together. And this year, when I think about your two books as a pairing, I'm struck by how incredibly ambitious they both are. Um, and in different ways, yes, but they are both structurally very unique. And I feel like they're each trying to make the novel do something new. Um, and that structure and form is a really big part of that and a bunch of other stuff too. Um, but you know, we only have a few minutes. So um, it's very exciting, your books. And I wondered if you could each talk a little about your relationship to the novel as a form, like a vessel, an opportunity, whatever, um, either as a reader or a writer, just how you think about the novel. I don't know if you want to go first, Pip give Kate a minute of a break. <laughs> um, okay. Oh my God. Um, so um, about 10 years ago, I went to a lecture where someone put forward a very compelling case for the novel being dead. And um, I just felt so sad because I just, I don't know, like I, I'm not, like I say, like I didn't go to university until a lot later and I, yeah, like just that word novel, you know, as in I don't know what a synonym for it is, but, you know, like um, new or unusual or, and, you know, this is what I think excites me most is that the novel has this capacity to reinvent the form with every iteration of it, if you know what I mean. And like, I don't know, like, especially around fiction, I, I have this friend um, who I taught with for a lot of years who used to say, we, we were, we we would teach in correctional facilities and people would say, what's the difference between fiction and nonfiction? And he'd say, oh, in nonfiction, there's this contract that what you're telling is true or has some relationship to true. In fiction, there's no contract at all. And I really, you know, to truth or, or you know, imagined. And I just really, I don't know, the novel excites me a lot. I mean, I really love poetry. I really love the short form. But there's something about the novel that just seems rambunctious and like kind of rebellious and radical and yeah I don't know like I, I feel very excited about the novel yeah as as a thing yeah not dead then N not not from where I'm standing but maybe I've maybe it died and I'm in some resurrection kind of scenario I don't know matrix kind of thing I don't know but yeah you are in the future for us right now so I don't know maybe over there yeah I mean what Pip said, you know, resonates really strong with me, strongly with me. I think for my my kind of uh, path to the novel, I mean, it's for a long time it's been it, as a reader. I've, you know, I would often, yeah, novels are the art form that I engage with most in my life. Even though I'm, I, you know, I, I work in in an art school where there are a lot, you know, students were exploring all different kinds of forms and media, and I would be the one with the novel in my bag. You know, that it's like this kind of, you know, what what art form counts most of me um, and since childhood has been the novel. So there's this kind of deep connection in, to it as a, as, a, as a durational form, you know, as a time-based form of length, you know, um, those simple things, which I think are actually like deeply consequential for, for this kind of the order of experience that it offers. Um, but 
I speak, yeah, I guess as a writer, you know, as you know, like having a practice as a translator, which is a, like deeply constrained practice, it's intensely creative, but you're really writing under constraint. And then hit what you were saying about nonfiction, like writing a nonfiction book. When I was, you know, yeah, truth packed as a sense of wanting to, I was writing sometimes from life, sometimes from other people's lives, dealing with ideas and arguments and the sense of it, yeah, this being the case, you know, what's in, in this little arts, like, kind of the, you know, mostly the case. And then this sort of, which now seems like really audacious to me, this sense of like, and now the novel, having not really written fiction before, like when I say not really, like not written fiction before, it really was like this massive sort of self-education of how to do this. And I think I had a note above my desk at some point of like, you are free, you know, like this is free. This is really, you can do anything. And if you're not going to embrace that freedom of it, you can do anything. So why be in this space? And that feels like just like, I guess coming from those different, those other forms, but just like total possibility. And of course it can close down. You start setting your own parameters of like, well, there's a living room and it's, there's a tree. And if I put a tree, I need to deal with the tree and the plant and whatever. But that's what excites me so much about Pip's novel is this sense of like, without saying too much about it, but like this, this expansion, this sort of, I set the terms and then I change them and I change them and I expand them. And that's just so thrilling to me. And I think that's what, why you might be into writing in these in fiction that rather than any other form is like if you're not going to really engage with that yeah like for me i'm like well, if you're here if we're here fictionalizing let's let's go let's do something let's push yeah if that makes makes sense yes that makes sense and you That's also great. can talk to each other i feel like I'm I feel like I'm like direct, you know, whatever. It's so hard, the Zoom world. Um, but just feel free to jump in if you want. Um, there, I, I thought I would actually bring in because it kind of connects the, the one question that, that's in the QA, even though we're not at that time. I'm just going to go nuts and ask it. Um, but it's a question, Kate, about form, I think. So I'm, I mean, I'm just kind of reading it right now. So it's from Daniel K. Hello, a question for Kate. Um, I love reading the long form, such a marvelous mix of fiction and essay. One of the book's most intriguing provocations is related to the role of the third person narrator in the modern novel. The apparent limited choice between having a narrator with limited knowledge e.g. attached to a specific character point of view, or having an omniscient narrator. The narrator in the long form says in a certain chapter that what the novel fully comprehends is not attributable to a given subject, i.e. the narrator, because it is knowledge produced by the interplay of the whole composition. I believe that is one of the most critical assertions made in Kate's book. I would love to hear her elaborate more on that and on some of the narrative choices made like narrating from the point of view of the delivery boy from the baby's perspective landscape descriptions from an omniscient view etc so pov questions for you yeah. well thank you so much for reading to the questioner and what wasn't it that's an extraordinary question thank you um yeah that was really it was really important to me that this novel be in the third person um for that capacity to rove and to move uh, for that mobility it seems to me like an extraordinary technology of the novel maybe very particular to the novel um one of the things that the novel of all forms art forms can do and i wanted to explore that initially in this sort of two-handed way between mother and baby so that the baby is as equal a force and a kind of presence in in the world of the novel as the adult that was important to me but i just read the um Kind of initial description of this mobile this black and white mobile which also appears through the through the book um visually and i think there's something in that that, that, that really was like if i need if i were to reach for a description or an image of the, of the long form it is in the mobile is this sort of de-centered or um moving composition um kinetic sculpture <laughs> um which can't doesn't actually have a fixed center it you know it has an arm but it's, it, it's, it's different parts are responsive and reactive and responding to each other. And there's something that the composition is doing, not only in its totality, like in the sense of the different shapes, you know, there are the waves, the dots, the triangle, whatever, but also in its situatedness, because then there, it's in a room and there's air and breath and temperature rising and falling. And Helen sometimes like twists it really hard to get it going again. So there's something about what the composition can do as a composition, which is not reducible to the knowledge of any one of its parts, including my own knowledge is like, 
you know, I'm, you know, there is a narrating consciousness there, which is like, I guess, more or less mine since it came from my head. But it's not only mine because there's, you know, there are these ideas from John Dewey, as I mentioned, there's Henry Fielding in there. There's, there is this collaborative, it's a collaborative production. And I really wanted to embrace the idea of a novel producing knowledge on those terms of, of collaboration in ways that it can do that. Yeah, as a, as, a, as a composition that moves the line I, you know, I just read was like, it moved, you know, she, she, she assembled it and she stepped away and, and now it's moving. And that seemed to me like a, a really sort of profound, image, profound, that sounds very, so my, 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 my profound image for my book, but they, I mean, an image not only for my book, but for the way that I think other novels function. That's like the start of an answer to a very, very yeah. important question for me, but um, yeah. No, that's so, I love hearing you talk about the mobile. Like I was thinking of asking you, so just for anyone who hasn't seen it, the images do indeed, like the pieces of the mobile, and now I won't find one, you know, just sort of appear at random, you know, I don't know, that wasn't Not really, random. Yeah, it wasn't, we laid it out very carefully, but <laughs> they, they appear, you know, throughout the book and they affect the book. And maybe we'll come back to that, but while we're kind of on POV, I just, Pip, I wonder if you, because the POV in your book is also like very specific um, and very novelistic. So I wonder if you have any anything to add on on that. Um, not not much. Um, oh, I was just thinking um, that um, this is something. Yeah, I like what what I think the book is very much a product of the time that I had to write it in. If you know what I mean, like I think I'm really interested in how books kind of um like they reflect the process in a way and I think that's that's what I really loved about hearing about that story about the lecture because I do feel like life seeps in this is so lame what I'm saying like not just lived experience but like the the air that we're breathing and the movements that we're making and stuff like that and largely the new animals was written in 15 minute slots like I I was really unsuccessful in getting grants or anything for any length of time and a friend of mine just said to me stop fucking complaining and just write that friggin' book and I was like okay what can I afford I can afford 15 minutes before you know while my kid is brushing his teeth and before work and that's what I'm going to write it in. So that's why it takes place in one day. Um, I, I didn't have any bigger, ugh. that's why it's probably in those rather uncouth, um, you know, like that weird cut in half kind of thing. Um, and yeah, like, and that's why I think it has the roving POVs. Like it was just like, I couldn't stick to one because it was very fragmented how I was writing it. So it just starts roaming and yeah, it, it was so fragmented in the writing. And I think that's what I really love about how, you know, with Kate's book, like I feel like time around it kind of is in the book as well, if you know what I mean, like that. Yeah. that I don't know. Like I really, really, really freaking love your book so much um but yeah so yeah that's really all I'm thinking I I love POV though I was a very confused reader like I said um I didn't my, read my first sort of adult novel until I was about 24 or 25 and I read Emma and I was just I was just like you know I was like hello and um I always have a lot of trouble with third person like I would often get in a lot of trouble when I did finally go to university saying who's who's talking and they're like it's a third person I'm like yes but where are they <laughs> like where are they standing and yeah so I just yeah I really I really love POV is my favorite subject so thank you so much Kate. I think just to follow what you said Pip, if I may like there's something in what I find so true and fascinating but also like inspiring by what you just said is that how I think so often like thrilling innovation which I think is like happening in the new animal is a pro it's not that often of like a product of like deliberate strategy of I'm going to innovate. It's like, <laughs> I've got 15 minutes and therefore what can I do? Like with, it, with my body, in my life, in my time, what makes sense to me to do? Oh, it's this. And then a reader like comes along, it's like, what is she up to? Like, how is she achieving these effects as if it, um, so I really like that kind of collapse of between situatedness of, of, of work, the work of writing and then what, what actually is happening in the book, like due to that that relation between those the you know your lived circumstances. So thank you for sharing that. I find yeah, right. yeah, and go and ahead. Also, I think that um collaboration as well, like the relational stuff. You know, like the the writer not in isolation. I think is just so 
yeah, like which I think is so apparent in your book, like that these conversations can take place with people that, you know, like we've had relationships through reading and um, yeah, I don't know, like I just find relationally it's really interesting as well because like I, you know, when I was young, I had this dream that a writer would be someone who stands on a cliff looking at the waves rolling in and, you know, no one interrupts them. And, um, you know, I just love the the books that I love the most are noisy with life, you know, like, I mean, like they're, they're just, you know, conversations and friends and they're peopled. And I really, yeah, I really love it. Yeah. Um, your book is noisy with life for sure. And actually it's so interesting to hear you talk about how you wrote it because it doesn't feel fragmented like the effect is actually the opposite it's like this seamless sweep um and like the roving feels very like Virginia Woolf in a way to me like this sort of and to me Wolf's the way Wolf manipulates POV always feels like this very fluid not fragmented thing um very beautiful okay so while I'm waiting for people to put questions in the Q&A um box thingy I'll ask a, you a question Pip um so in something you wrote recently, you said you were turning toward more overt form of political action in your writing. Um, and I think this was describing a turn subsequent to the writing of The New Animals, yet The New Animals is in really important ways a very political book itself. Um, and so clearly the relationship of literature and efficacy is something you've given a lot of thought to and it's something you care a lot about. And I just wondered if you would talk about how your thoughts on this have changed over the years with relation to your work in particular? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about The New Animals is that it is a 2016 book. So it kind of like it, I walked the book on a particular day. So there was a day that I chose and I walked around Auckland in the same places and those things that were there sort of come into the book. And like, so it holds this very strange place, which is kind of pre-Trump, pre Brexit pre you know the hideous things that have happened here in New Zealand and like it I think that I think that what happened is as things got worse I realized that I had to be louder if you know what I mean like I couldn't just sort of I, I thought ambiguity was like this um like magic thing you know if I just show you back the world you'll see where the problems are and you know like do your thing but I've become a lot more didactic I think since that book but also you know like um yeah and I think it, it's an interesting turn for me to take because you know like I sort of my early love was kind of those real stylists with the light touch and you know and I think I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it a lot. I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed saying where I stand. And I think, I don't know if that's a feature of society at the moment, but I just think it's really important for me to make it extremely clear where I stand because I think, you know, bad faith readings are quite available and, you know, language is so, I don't, I don't, totally know what it's like where you all live but here language is used as this massive weapon and people decide they own words and you know like they'll decide how that word's defined so yeah I think it's that kind of shift but also like what's interesting I just need to mention Janet Frame who is an author a New Zealand author um and um this book is very much based on a book um she well it isn't very much based but the structure of her the way that she wrote this book which is called intensive care gave me this the kind of faith to write this book or the you know like the company to write this book and um yeah, like that is a very political book as well. Um, it's about war. It's about um, how we place disabled people in community. It's about, yeah, it, it's all, it's kind of, it's about eugenics. It was written, you know, um, just after, well, a little while after the Second World War. And yeah, like I just think, yeah, like those kind of, um, I don't know, like those people that give you strength, you know, like, yeah, Janet Frame is definitely one of them. So I just want to mention her because, yeah, she's amazing. She she is no longer with us, but I reckon read everything by her. But everybody knows. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Kate, so a quest, some questions have come into the q and I don't know if you want to respond to what Pip just said, if you had anything you wanted to say, or, or I can ask you a question from over there. What? Kate. I have some, well, I, I, yeah, it's so much to say actually about, but I don't know if I'm ready to, I can articulate it in the moment. So let's move, let's yeah. move and I'll come back. Okay. To okay. Yeah. Um, I feel like we could do this for three hours for sure. Right. But I know Spencer won't let us. Um, How much do you want me to say? I get going and then I like, we'll be here. 
I know. Um, okay. So someone, put, I saw someone put this in the chat and then posted it in the Q and A section. So they really want to answer. So um, this is Dorothy. Do you ever get stuck when details from real experiences in your own life start steeping into your fiction? Do you have advice on overcoming hesitation to fictionalize things that originate in real life experience? And I thought I would ask you that. It was just to both of you. I thought I'd start with you, Kate, because you sort of talked about that that seed moment coming from life experience, like how to dramatize trying to get a baby to sleep. Yeah. Interestingly, the hesitation I had, to, when I said, you know, let's embrace the, the fictional, let's, let's, let's move and let's go somewhere. If we're, if we're in that space of, if we're in fiction, then why not truly make it fictional? And there's a scene in, in the long form where, which kind of couldn't happen chronologically or like it has this kind of, speculative moment and um, yeah I really enjoyed writing that but it's interesting I think the hesitancy was more for me around how to actually make things up rather than how to not use what's happened and that, that relate something that you know it's, the book is in some ways still deeply in conversation with the translation projects I did and um and Holland Barthes uh, lecture course on the novel um, he says something about his resist, why he's this desire for the novel, um, but also a resistance to the novel. And he describes it for himself as a, as a moral resistance to making making things up in this kind of this sort of quite grandiose terms. But it, it then goes into a really interesting discussion about ethics and truth and, and so on. And, and it's something I feel like I was sharing. Like if it's not got some kind of grounding in something that observable or knowable or and that, but that material didn't need, need not have come from my direct experience. It could also come from something I've read, or something that um, a friend has told me, but like five years ago, or that some distant. But I needed to have that some kind of ground in order to give myself permission to to write it. Um, and then through the writing, I did feel like there was a kind of detachment that was operating, a kind of separation, and that I could kind of pull, you know, pull a bit further. And, and pull a bit further so I mean there is a lot if you know me well like you know or you were around when my eldest was a newborn you might be like there are some things here Kate that like you know I recognize but then there was you know it was yeah so I don't know if I've answered your question about helping with the with the hesitancy I think it's very interesting to sort of just think about where the hesitancy, sit, hesitancy sits um, and I think that's clearly quite different for, for each of us um, but I think it's also very interesting to think like when does something start to operate as, as material, as like touchable material for you? And for me, it's not actually absolutely everything. And that's not necessarily to do with what I want to narrate or, or what the project of the book is. It's just there's, there's some things I feel I can touch and work with. And there's other things that I just think I, you know, it's an amazing story and I admire it. Or, but I, I can't, I can't do anything with that. And I, I find that fascinating talking to other writers um, at all stages about where those parameters are. But I think those weird parameters that often come from some weird unconscious place are also the sorts of constraints like Pip's 15 minutes that actually can produce, that's where innovation actually happens. If that helps at all, like I feel like with the question, we can talk about this for a lot longer because yeah. it's fascinating. No, that's um, great. Yeah, that would be my answer for now. Yeah. Pip, do you want to add anything? Um, I yeah, I I think this is a really um interesting thing, and something was in my brain, and then it disappeared. That happens a lot. Um, oh yeah, I was just gonna say um. Yeah, I get very, very confused by people and situations and life. And often what I'm writing is to try and work things out. Like I can make these little dioramas of life and say, oh, that person said that. I didn't really understand why they said that. And um, I think that um, so life is in there in that way. Um, I've got um, Emma Hislop is here, amazing writer. Rowan is an incredible book. Um, but um, we often talk about this thing that another friend of ours, Emily Perkins, amazing writer, lioness, um, wrote, um, said to us about how there's the real life, but it's where it takes off from real life that it gets fiction and interesting, if you know what I mean. And I think that's often how it is for me is that I might start with a, a 
you know, I feel mortified a lot of the time, like, you know, like, why did I say that? Uh, and, you know, like I just have these intrusive thoughts and, you know, I, again, I get confused by people and it's often that is the starting off point. It's like, Jim said X and I said Y and that didn't feel good and what the heck happened and could I write a scene where I <laughs> it's yeah it's just and I think I think that's you know so for me the hesitancy is often it doesn't come with the writing because that's kind of a private kind of thing but then there's that decision to publish which I think is a different kind of thing altogether so yeah it's 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 yeah and yeah I really I really loved what Kate said about that stuff yeah that it could be recognizable but yeah I don't know it's yeah I've been reading a lot of Jung as well I'm thinking about that as well but sorry another Um, time no I was just gonna say my least favorite thing that happens well I mean not really but a thing I don't like um is when anyone in my family sees my work and then they're like I know exactly when and I just like I hate that feeling so much when someone wants to tie it back down to like whatever little instigating moment created a whole other thing Spencer am I allowed to ask one more question from the chat I don't want to like Spencer's probably like in another room eating tacos or something at this point. Um, okay. I'm going to ask one more then. So this is from our own Karen author of Revenge of the Scapegoat over here in the Q and a. So Karen says, I'm so, so curious now to know what happens in Pip's book. So you're just going to have to read it, Karen. Um, but Karen says, maybe Pip or Kate could talk a bit about how plot works in writing a novel, especially novels that are essayistic or ruminative or anyway, doing all this other stuff. How do you care about or tend to or find out or make up what happens? And then it says, plot is so confusing to me in parentheses. So plot thoughts. I mean, should I go, I I was, hmm. I think a key word for me is momentum. Think, or maybe momentum plus rhythm more than plot but I think you can get a lot happening um at least I trust I mean I, you know then you don't know you, you I can get a lot happening for myself as like the first reader <laughs> with the hope that this might actually work for someone else in in something like what well, in the not in the long form there is a section called the knowledge of contrast which comes from Henry Fielding a kind of is a kind of aesthetic theory of how you achieve continuity. How do you keep something going? How do you make something of length? And the idea is it's a very simple idea of, of, um, of texture and contrast moving from not staying in one key, but, but changing, making micro, micro changes or, or, or maximal changes. And I think there's something that can happen, a kind of charge that can happen between um, two elements, which... Um, which encourages that sort of turn of the page. I keep on doing this like I want to bounce it out or something, but I think that it's at that level that I, I think about plottedness. I think a lot about engagement and not being boring. Like really, I really feel like it's such an extraordinary thing to be read and to, to, be, to be given for pages to be given the, you know, you lend your imagination to pages. So as a writer, if you've, if you've received that, then what are you doing? that's you know and I, I, I think yeah I think a lot about how to hold and move that attention but um it's probably very unhelpful because I don't think I think a lot about plot in in those terms it's much more at the level of of transition work actually um yeah but Pip what does Pip say given yeah given that a ton of things happen in the new animals um over this day like you know what doesn't happen um yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I just the thing that's at my the forefront of my mind is um um Jordy Rosenberg um Confessions of the Fox um wrote or talked or said this incredible thing about how a novel can have a thesis statement just like an essay can have a thesis statement and like yet the novel is maybe not quite so concerned with proving or um not proving, but maybe not so concerned with coming down on one side or the other. And I find this idea of a thesis question really interesting, you know, just going back to what I said about finding things confusing, like I find power confusing. And, you know, like, I think that often, you know, that thesis question, you know, like it, it, I think essays are a really that idea of I think that the essay means an attempt and like I really love that idea that things can be recursive and 
you know, like it, you know, like you can have another go at it and approach it again and da da da. And I think that, um, you know, I think that builds into plot for me, you know, like it's like, okay, so what's another thing that could go wrong to help us with that thesis question? So yeah, I think building it that way, I think is of interest to me. And yeah, and I, I'm really obsessed with plot and I'm very obsessed with plotlessness as well. You know, like I, yeah, I I really like, I love Kelly Reinhardt's film so freaking much. And that latest one that comes in, you know, way after where we would normally start a book, um, you know, and I just, I just think it's amazing. Also, I just want to be careful. I know when people say things that other people have said, sometimes they get them wrong. So maybe Jordan never said that. I just heard it. Um, so yeah, I just, want, yeah, but I, it was very, it really hit me when I was writing new animals that thought. So, yeah. That's amazing. I, I, that is really interesting whether Jordy said that or not. Um, thank you. Here's Spencer. Hey, it's Spencer. Um, this has been phenomenal. Uh, and it is every time we host Dorothy authors. Uh, so I expected nothing less, but Danielle, thank you so much for moderating. Um, Pip and Kate, this has been a positive honor, uh, to have this on our screen. Um, and to all of those of you watching on a Saturday or Sunday morning, uh, thank you so much. Um, with all these disparate time zones, it's just so lovely to see people come together, uh, including four different bookstores, uh, which include, of course, Third Place Books, Community Bookstore, Thank You Books, um, and Barrazzo's Bookstore. So what a phenomenal team. Um, thank you all, and please be well. Have a great rest.